Hi everybody, just wanted to give a quick content warning for this episode. Uh, Big Little Lies deals with physical abuse and sexual assault, so James and I do end up discussing it a little bit, so just be aware. Hopefully you enjoy the episode. They're playing like politics with people's lives and they're getting so caught up in their fights that like they're like Madeline's daughter, for example, is like, I would rather go to the birthday party than some stupid Disney on ice thing. And it's, it doesn't matter because Madeline's like, well, you're part of the battle. That's the thing that reminds me of lords and ladies in their castles, honestly, like going to war with each other. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, friends, to episode 273 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm filmmaker James Bailey. And I'm writer Luke Elliott. And this week, we discuss the first four episodes of Jean-Marc Vallée's 2017 series, Big Little Lies. I'm so excited that you finally had an experience with the adaptation of this material. Yep. We both enjoyed uh, the first half of the novel last week, but now we're into the series. And I mentioned last week when this series was coming out, it, right around the time, right before this podcast was started, actually, I remember it was my favorite show on TV. I was, you know, anticipating each episode. Admittedly, my girlfriend, Caitlin, got me interested in it. Like she she got me into the first two episodes or so, and then I was just hooked. Yeah. Um, and so it's been since then that I've watched this series and going back, I'm like, God damn, this holds up so well. And it's so <laughs> fun to watch. And, yeah. uh, you know, in, in some cases, it's not quite as fun, but it's it's. um riveting film you know i would say yeah. it's a riveting show well made yeah i'm enjoying it man i missed this one you know i i knew it was coming out but it was one that i knew we might cover so it was one that i kind of set aside and uh, i'm glad that we finally got to it because yeah i'm having a lot of fun with it what a cast and beyond just our you know our, our main leads like everybody there's just so many familiar faces people who've gone on to become even bigger stars since this was out um, but also just well made, like, you know, there's, it's, it's artistically made. There's lots of cool flourishes. Uh, there's lots of cool transitions, all kinds of stuff. Jean-Marc Vallée has a particular style, this like naturalistic style. And if you remember, we talked about Jean-Marc Vallée way back in, uh, Sharp Objects in like 2018 when that was coming out. Which was also incredible. So incredible. that's so cool to see, to see too, where he just like knocked it out of the park now. Super strong vision and and i love like the way that he uses natural lighting and he really uses the locations to to as characters themselves as to to sell the world as well realized and lived in yeah monterey instead of australia i had to look it up so like i had heard of monterey but i was like where exactly is it i was pretty sure it was california it is and then i was i was like i know well, obviously coastal but like where on the coast because there's a massive coast of, of california and i was reading that it's central california so I was like, okay, that's that's a part of California I've never been. Like I've been to San Francisco and I've been to L.A. Right. Um, Is San Francisco not considered like middle of? I think it's more northern. It's like the first major city. Well, I don't know if this is true. <laughs> <laughs> it's towards the. It's like closer to the border of Oregon than I think like a central central California would be. Very striking. I like the Pacific, the look of the Pacific, because it's so different than where I grew up. And, yeah. you know, in that reminds reason. me a lot of the Oregon coast, which is absolutely stunning. Um, but it's like a version of the Oregon coast that seems like, I mean, I don't know. We're not seeing a lot of scenes of people surfing or anything, but it does seem like, you know, a little more approachable than the, the Oregon coast could sometimes be. Okay, yeah. But the Pacific in general is just like so um I've always found it to be like elemental, like powerful, mysterious, large rock formations and then the waves smashing into giant yeah. cliff sides and stuff. Yeah. Like it's violent looking at it. I think he like I mean I know it's different episodes were directed by different people, I assume. No, he directed all of them. He directed all of them. Okay. Yeah, the whole show. Awesome. Then this totally holds up. I was like it feels like whoever's directing this has like that an eye for that, like realizes that that inherent violence and energy really lends itself to the subject matter um like sort of thematically and i felt like he was really leaning into that and there's a lot of shots like that and i love how our characters just kind of stare out at the sea all the time um and i actually got had this observation where it feels like we're looking at a bunch of lords and ladies who like live in castles like surveying like the that. land and like you know, talking about going to these parties and like their big court appearances and everything's so important and like their lives, like they're 
they're so caught up in it. And like some of these houses are un are absolutely unbelievable. They feel like castles when you see them, and I'm just like, holy cow! Like I don't know how. I don't know if I could like take myself seriously if I lived in a house like that. <laughs> I'd feel ridiculous. Or you take yourself too seriously, and that's the problem, right? <laughs> you end up going the other direction. Exactly. You convince yourself that you deserve to have this palatial mansion. Right. I read that um, of all the mansions and things that we see, the only one that's actually located in the Monterey Peninsula is Celeste and Perry's house, which is probably the most striking it's, to yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, also, um, Renata's is insane. Renata's is amazing. That, that yeah. freaking staircase <laughs> is unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. But even like even like Madeline's house is wild. Like they're all pretty fucking huge and, and, and impressive, except for, of course, Jane's, which is a really nice distinction. As you see, she has a very humble looking house by comparison. By comparison. But it is funny. I found myself, you know, this was made in 2017. We're in 2023. We know how the housing market has been. And it's just funny to see. Like, I, I kept thinking, like, all right, you're working part time. You're, you're somehow able to avoid and yeah, they make a point of saying that like <laughs> yeah. some of some of the Monterey area is lower income than than necessarily, you know, the rich mansion. Well, she's clearly inland. She doesn't have a view of the of the beach, you know. So it's a good distinction. But at the same time, I'm like, you know, that's probably a five hundred thousand dollar house now. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say part time single income. Like that's a tough house to acquire these days in Monterey, I'm sure. Yeah, um, totally. I also read that it was filmed in Pacific Grove, Pebble Beach, Carmel Highlands, and Sierra Madre, California. Okay, so all just along the coast sounds like probably looking for a specific house feel, that kind of thing that they wanted to differentiate. Even the coast is probably a little different for each each person. That way, it fits the personality a little better. I like yeah. that. You know, play with it a little bit. Jean Marc Vallée has come. He he talked about how it was a film. Like they shot yeah eight hour film basically. Um, where they went out, or I guess seven hours in this case, and he went out of his way to like structure it. And this is something I loved hearing, being somebody who works in film and knows what it's like to be on a set and what 12 hour and beyond days do and 10 hours days do. I saw that Jean-Marc Vallée pushed through the production of this to only shoot from about 9 to 6, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. So he, for one, shot a lot with natural light and, you know, still manipulating the light, but using using the sun uh, because he felt like it, it helped portray the the emotions of the characters that he wanted to show. But the idea of someone who prioritizes like the mental health of the crew because they shot for such a long time. This was like five months of shooting. And you think of the people who were involved, the actors who are also producers in some cases, the cases of Reese Witherspoon and Nicole Kidman. Um, they're involved in some of that creative process. And I'm just always I know it costs more money and there are things that that are obstacles, but the idea of getting to really focus in on the art and why you're there and not worry about being efficient and not, you know, all of these things that kind of have to be overcome. The idea of shooting for uh, eight to nine hours a day, make sure the crew doesn't get burnt out. And then also the actors can focus on giving the best performances and overall give a pleasant experience to the thing that we're all supposed to enjoy, which is creating art. So I just, uh, I, th I thought that was awesome. And I actually do know quite a few people that I work with that, that like producers that are pushing and I think the industry is maybe changing in some ways to kind of push to more I would say crew friendly hours and and like having people in mind because you hear horror stories of people you know trying to stay up for like two days straight to work a gig and driving home after that and how dangerous that can be so yeah. you know I, again I think prioritizing not just the art but the people behind it and I think it just gives me a good feeling for this series in general. Totally, man. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. You know, obviously I didn't know any of that, but you know, I'm happy to hear it. And it's not the other way where it's like, oh my God, they grinded for 18 hours a day. And yeah, you know, like long I, shoot, five months shoot, but. And plus you maybe you're in Monterey, so you're enjoying it a little bit. Right, right. <laughs> and that's what I mean. The, you know, actors are also producers on this. And so yeah. like, it doesn't sound like it was this like nightmarish set that we hear about sometimes. And I just love the way that like, you know, the, the attention to like giving us these inserts that are really important for like evoking not just the mystery, but the emotion of the scene and how people feel about each other, the subtle looks and the reactions. Yeah. And it's just that that level of detailed filmmaking that we talk about in a lot of our favorite projects. So I, I was happy to see it here. And like I said, it holds up in ways and I've developed as a filmmaker since this show came out originally so much and seeing it, I just appreciate it even more so. For right, that. right. Well, I still don't know you know, the answers to the mysteries. And it was pretty close to where we left off in the book. Um, now, the show has made some interesting changes. It definitely added a lot, it feels like, um, a lot of additive changes. Um, and, you know, I have thoughts about the way that affects a lot of the characters and that affects some of my predictions, 
which I'm excited to make, even though I can't really bounce them off you because you know the answers to most of it. <laughs> so uh, It sounds like we both enjoy the show so far. We're looking forward to more. Were you bummed that we had to stop? Definitely enjoying it, man. Absolutely. So I, I watched um, three episodes in a row the, um, two days ago. And then I was like, oh, I better save one for tomorrow so I have something else to, you know, that way it can be fresh. And so I saved episode four um, and totally like I watched it and I immediately wanted to watch like three episodes in a row again. <laughs> like I was like ready to just binge this thing because it is um, it's really compelling, just like the book. Like I really want to know. And then um, ironically, um, we're going to announce that at the end of this episode, but I'll just say it now. We're taking a week off next week um, where I'm going camping and we got some things going on. So we're taking a week off, which means it's going to be two weeks before I get to finish out this thing. And I'm like, oh man, it's going to be tough. Um, but you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll crack the book first, read that, read the end in the coming week and, uh, save the show for when I get back. Cause I could do some, I could do some reading out of the coast. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that makes sense to read right? something about a coastal <laughs> town when you're out by the coast. Yeah. I'm excited to keep watching as well. I, I remember some of the things that happen, but like the subtleties, you know, they kind of over time you lose that. And, uh, I was really you know, enthralled with with how the story is going and some of the hints that they're throwing in because I know the answers this time around. Right. Uh, so I'm kind of picking up on some of that. You can see what is what are red herrings and what aren't. You know, that's always exactly. fun that when you watch a mystery again. What about the experience of having read now? Like, what is that bringing mm. to this this time around? Seeing it depicted on screen makes me appreciate the source material even more. Um, I think that a lot of the characters were so re- well realized in the book that they just were like, you just adapt them pretty much as they are in the book and they're perfect in the show. And then like seeing what each actor brought to those roles, often I feel like a great performance can elevate source material in ways as well. And and I think like it's already a multidimensional character and then you add in a good performance and somebody who really sells it. And like both things are just symbiotic. They're making me appreciate each other more and more. So there are things that the show does a little bit differently as much as I feel like it's very faithful adaptation. Yes. I agree with that, too. That maybe makes the mystery a little more convoluted in ways, I think, it's time. Yeah, and- yeah, I think so. It also changes the vibe slightly, if I could talk about, like, vibe, <laughs> which is a very general, like, and subjective thing. But to me, the vibe of the show leans a little more dark and dramatic. There's certainly elements of humor and lightness and like these people are kind of ridiculous. Like there's definitely lots of elements of that. HBO prestige drama, right? It like feels it's... like HBO. And in and, and the yeah. way when I was reading the book, I was really struck by how much it felt like a really light, almost cozy story at times that then dipped into some real darkness. And I, I was impressed with the way um, Leanne Moriarty was able to blend those two things um and it's not that i don't like the way the show is doing it i like it too it's just it's slightly different right like i think um john mark valet's view of this is maybe to lean into the drama a little more and i think it's working yeah let's actually talk about john mark valet um so just to to rip the band-aid off and let you know he tragically passed last year oh my god i did not i did not know that jesus wow yeah. uh damn yeah, I remember it happening. It was very sudden, out of nowhere. Clearly, someone who was who was on a meteoric rise, um, and I thought right away because it was in it was December twenty fifth of twenty twenty one. I was like, oh my gosh, he was fifty eight years old. I was like, maybe it was COVID related, and I never got any confirmation on that. And from from what I could see, it didn't have to do with COVID. But you never know with like some of those. Things yeah, well, and- because COVID, something that is from all accounts seems to like exacerbate other health problems, but. Anyway, man, that's that's so tragic. From what I could see, it was some sort of some sort of existing condition or something that happened. Um, so it was really sudden and, and tragic. Shit. And following his death, the Directors Guild of Canada, because he's a Canadian filmmaker first, uh, renamed its its DGC Discovery Award for Emerging Filmmakers to the Jean Marc Vallée DGC Discovery Award in his memory. Um, and there's been a documentary in development, and I, it may even be out now, which I'd be interested in seeing. Because okay, he's, yeah. I would be really interested to see that. I mean, like between this and Sharp Objects, I, I'm just such a fan. And like, I, have you ever seen Dallas Buyers Club? No, I haven't. Is that also him? He also wow. directed Dallas Buyers Club, which got tons of you know Academy acclaim. Yeah, I remember that being an awards darling. You know, when it came out. And the other one he worked on with Reese Witherspoon was called Wild, which was oh, sort yeah. of. Oh yeah, I've heard. I've been meaning to watch that, but it's also like based off a book, although I think it's nonfiction. But it's off, the the book is famous, so I keep thinking like maybe that's one we might consider. And knowing that it's that director, that that makes me even more excited about it. That's such, you know, yeah, I mean, I need to explore the work he did and he left. And that's like one of the things I love about art is that people can leave that kind of um, 
that kind of legacy behind and you can go back and experience their work again. But it is a shame to to think like that one of these people who is doing such a good job at adapting stuff is no longer with us because I was like, I was going to say like, oh man, I want to see what he does going forward. Everything he makes. Yeah, I was I was yeah. excited for that. That's a real that's a real shame. I mean, just to his track record is like since since around the time of, of Dallas Buyers Club when I became aware of him, like you know, Sharp Objects was one of my favorites of that year, and just working in that HBO space, and then this this series, and then he had some influence on the second season of this, and it's just let's talk a little more about him and and like sort of his background. So he was a Canadian filmmaker, film editor, and screenwriter. After studying film at university. Université de Montréal, Vallée went on to make a number of critically acclaimed short films, inc- including Stereotypes, Les Fleurs Magiques, and Les Mats Magiques. His debut feature, Blacklist, was nominated for nine Genie Awards, including nods for Vallée's direction and editing. His fourth film feature, Crazy, received further critical acclaim and was a financial success. Due to Vallée's perfectionism and the tight budget, the film took almost 10 years to make. Valet's follow-up, The Young Victoria, garnered strong reviews and received three Academy Award nominations. His sixth film, Café de Flore, was the most nominated film at the 32nd Genie Awards. Valet's next films, The American Dramas, Dallas Buyers Club, and Wild, continued this acclaim, and the former earned him a nomination for Academy Award for Best Film Editing. He was a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in the Director's Branch from 2014 until his death in 2021. Valet ventured into television by executive producing and directing two projects for HBO, the drama series Big Little Lies and thriller miniseries Sharp Objects. For the former, he won the Primetime Emmy for Outstanding Directing for a Limited or Anthology Series or Movie. Yeah, I mean, if if it's not clear, if you're a fan of Big Little Lies and you haven't seen Sharp Objects, you should absolutely watch it. I think you would really like it. Yeah. He directed four actors to Oscar-nominated performances, including Reese Witherspoon, Laura Dern, Matthew McConaughey, and Jared Leto. Leto and McConaughey won for their performances in, in Dallas Buyers Club, and he has directed three Emmy Award-winning performances, Laura Dern, Alexander Skarsgård, and Nicole Kidman in Big Little Lies. Oh, so they're the ones who won for this one? Interesting. They all, they've all they all been great. So Skarsgård is someone you know we haven't talked about at all, but um, yeah, I was really excited to see him. He's, he's like one of my favorite actors these days. Like He's amazing, and he plays a dangerous character so well, and um, he is scary here, And he's, but he's like... It's really interesting. It's almost more unusual to see him when he's being nice and he's being a good dad. Um, and then he turns on that rage and that danger. And it's like, I still don't know what the fucking make of this Perry guy. I'm like, is he a serial killer? Like this guy could be like when he's going on all these trips, is he like out there like hunting women? Like what's going on with this guy? Because he could be that or he could just be like, like have like rage problems. I, I don't know. He was one of the the changes that they made, I think, a little bit in the way that he seems more unhinged almost like in ways in some ways i don't know one of the things i was noticing and and this is uh, i think valet did this in sharp objects as well i think it was smart is a lot of the like interiority of the book and the way that um we see celeste and perry's relationship is all through the lens of celeste and her opinion about her relationship and she even like owns in the book she's like this is just my side of it and she's conflicted about it for those reasons. And I think he looked at that and said, well, the camera is just going to see what's going on. So he wanted to try and present a more like full picture of it. And because of that, we get a lot more of Perry and we get, um, I thought it was a really smart addition in like later and a later episode where Perry and Celeste go to that counselor together and actually reveal the abuse that's been going on. And we see Perry like play the victim a little bit and like, but also, no, not victim, but he he, he kind of like he's like he's kind of sulky and he makes it about how like he's self-conscious about her leaving him and her love and all this stuff. And like you can see the way he is he he and he at least like lies to himself about it. I don't know. Um, and that all just makes him like a like you said, like a, a more. I don't know, interesting, rounded character, but also like scarier and more dangerous in some ways. Yeah. Well, probably a psychopath. I don't I don't know, man. I don't know if I could diagnose him as that because it's like. Unless, unless everything with the kids and the rest of the family is com- is is a, like a complete front. That's what it feels like to me. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you know more than me, so I'm like, I, I'm cur- I'm still curious to see what happens with him as it goes forward because I think that that's going to be a big 
like something's building in this relationship and I don't know what. Um, yeah, I just can't help but like every time he's being nice, see it as a manipulation yeah. or some way that he's... if he's a secret serial killer, then yeah, it's all it's all like a, a front. It's all like he's he's uh, compartmentalized his life in a way and it's all more about the status and the the he wants to have a, the look of this perfect family than anything else. But then it could, you know, maybe he's someone who just has rage problems and, you know, that's scary in and of itself. And and this is how it's manifesting. I don't know. I got to say my my favorite performance. First of all, Skarsgård is amazing in the show. He's also on HBO's speed dial clearly because he's been in like every HBO, like even as 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 recently as Succession. He was in Succession, plays a really crazy character in Succession, too. So he's he's always a joy to watch. And like in this show, he is incredibly creepy and scary and like abusive. It's such an unusual performance for him again, because you get to see him in this like sort of domestic situation that I'm just not used to. Like usually he's such a larger than life character. Like he's a, you know a mortal vampire or he's a fucking viking you know like um, i'm not used to this and also i just think it's funny that uh him and nicole kidman play husband and wife here and then like a little bit later she was his mom <laughs> in the northman <laughs> yeah that's very true actually i hadn't put those two <laughs> yeah. things together i hadn't thought about that um yeah so I, I think speaking of nicole kidman she has my favorite performance in the show she's really good yeah even through the first half here she like there's so many layers to this performance she's so many different people to so many different people you know what i mean so like to to madeline she's playing a different character and then there's times when she's like able to have some agency and do law practice law almost and the way that that brings a different side of her and then the the way that she's like confrontational to perry but like because of obviously what he's doing um, and then also meek at times and then also kind of defending Perry in, in their counseling. That's, that's one spot where I really liked having read the book as I was watching her performance. Cause I could kind of decipher what she was doing in a way that I think if you, on your first watch, you're like, what is going on with her? Because she has these mysterious looks that she gives and she gives to her kids and she gives to Perry and you see her go through this entire range of emotions, starting out happy, going to darkness, going to sadness, looking angry and like terrified, and then coming back to sadness. And it all happens in such a short period of time, and it's all just in the eyes and expression. That's really incredible stuff. So yeah, I agree. I think she she's doing really impressive work, and that's hard to do. And so you get someone with chops like Nicole Kidman to come in, who I think is honestly like absolutely perfect she might be the most yeah. perfect for the role she plays yeah and i gotta say while we're just sitting here talking about this something that i found in my research i did not realize in the novel perry is described as physically resembling tom cruise quote women always took to perry it was that tom cruise white tooth smile and the way he gave them his oh, full attention right. <laughs> yeah 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 in this adaptation celeste is played by nicole kidman who in her real life was married to tom cruise from 1990 to 2001 yeah and before his like Scientology weirdness kind of freaked her out or possibly like the beginning of it and yeah. yeah yeah he like went really hard into it and wanted her to come with him and she's like I'm not gonna do that so yeah pretty pretty wild to kind of see a performance that maybe in some ways mirrors some weirdness that she you know dealt with but you know that's that's obviously digging really far yeah along with Nicole Kidman Reese Witherspoon announced that they optioned the rights to Leanne Moriarty's Big Little Lies on August 6th of 2014, less than a month after the book's publication. Wow. The two of them were expecting to develop the project as a film in which they would star and act as executive producers. Moriarty was also expected to produce. In November of that year, the actresses announced the format's shift into that of a limited-run television series written by David E. Kelly, who is also very important to this process. He's the showrunner in this case, and obviously collaborated very well with Jean-Marc Vallée, who directed all the episodes. In May 2015, HBO gave the series a production order, and Kelly was announced to join the team of executive producers. David E. Kelly also wrote all of the episodes. This is very, this reminding me of like True Detective Season 1 situation, right? Uh, in what way? Well, isn't there like the show? Run- I'm drawing a blank on the names of these people, but and then like um, a director who directed all the episodes. Uh, Carrie Fukunaga. Yeah, directed yeah. all the episodes, but then the sh- the creator and the director was a different guy. I I'm not sure who who did what in that show, but maybe it sounds like it. Uh, I just looked it up. Nick Pizzolatto, which I should have remembered because he's gone on to I think continue to be the showrunner for the entire series. But when Fukunaga left, I think the there was a I think there was a certain magic to that first season. 
that has at least wet, you know ebbed and flowed a little bit in the later seasons, to put it mildly. I'm excited for that new season. I am excited for season four. Season three was excellent, too. I really liked it. I was rewatching season one some recently, and I was like, God damn, this is like one of my favorite seasons of television. <laughs> yeah. But I like the idea of like two two people coming together. You know, the writing has like a, a consistency um, and, a, and a sort of creative vision. And then the direction also has a consistency like that. That show feels like it's one thing, like one long film in that way, because it's one director the whole time. Right. And it's kind of one of those scenarios where like the blurred line between there's the writer and the showrunner. And then there's the director who's on for all the episodes and like kind of who's making what calls. And- well, and. I mean, I just I don't want to talk too much about True Detective, but I, I remember hearing about like they butted heads a lot. And like sometimes that conflict, you end up getting brilliance out of it. You know, I, I have to say, I don't I didn't see anything to that uh, extent with this project here. Like, I, I think from what I heard, it was it was very amicable. Yeah, and that's probably more than norm. <laughs> and plus, this is based off of a book, which True Detective isn't in, in that way. So, like, you know, the, there's, it's different. But um, that's the way I thought television was made for a, like when I was like younger, at probably until who knows how old, older than you think. <laughs> like I thought it was all directed by one person. You know what I mean? When you watch a show and like this is all one like the idea that they had these directors who come in and do individual episodes was not something that was something like not something that I thought possible for a long time. I don't know why, but it just seemed weird to me. Well, it, like I said, I think the the role of showrunner is more it depends on the project how how much of an influence the showrunner has um because there are ones where a showrunner really does run the show and they have people almost guest direct. They come in, especially those long form like network shows that had like 28 episodes a season, they'd have people come in and do a couple episode runs. But and- prestige dramas do that all the time too. Yeah, they absolutely do. And it's, you know, it's cool to see that the consistency stays because of either showrunner or filmmaker. But in this case, this is kind of the best of both worlds. Jean-Marc Vallée was actually in talks to just direct the first episode and potentially one or two others for this show. And then his involvement eventually came to be all seven episodes. And I feel like that was true for Sharp Objects as well. I mean, I might be wrong about that, but I, I, I seem to remember us talking about a consistency of vision. Um, well, so Sharp Objects came out after the show. So I think on the success of Big Little Lies, he was given... Oh, really? I guess that... The opportunity to make Sharp Objects. <laughs> That's funny because in my mind, you know what I mean? Like I I've, I watched Sharp Objects years ago and now I'm just watching this. But yeah, I guess that, that tracks. And Marty Noxon was the one that we talked about that was the showrunner for... Um, for sharp objects and then john mark valet directed all, episodes, all the episodes from wow. what i can remember cool okay so are you ready to get into the plot of some of these episodes yeah we better get into it all right so episode one is called somebody's dead at an elementary school in monterey california a murder occurs at a school fundraiser but neither the victim nor the murderer is revealed flashing back to the first day of school the families of five first graders are introduced madeline martha mckenzie is a strong-willed and wealthy woman in town who is struggling to cope with her ex-husband Nathan's marriage to a yoga instructor named Bonnie while also trying to build a relationship with her oldest daughter, Abigail. Madeline's friend Celeste Wright is a retired lawyer and the mother of twin sons who are also beginning at the same school. Madeline and Celeste befriend Jane Chapman, a young single mother who moved to Monterey hoping to provide her son Ziggy with a better life. Amabella, the daughter of the equally wealthy and volatile Renata Klein accuses Ziggy of attempting to choke her at school, which he denies. Celeste appears to have a very happy life with her husband, Perry, but he is privately violent towards her. This was a, gr- a really good introduction. Um, we, you know, we start out with these flashing lights and it's all disorienting. And I was curious to see if they were going to maintain the, the like sort of dual pronged mystery of who died and who did it. Um, and they did. And, and, I think that's why this show is so hard to predict for me because I don't know who died. I can't begin to come up with any sort of motive because I'm like, I don't even know who died. So it becomes really difficult to predict what actually happened here. But I feel like you don't see that very often. Usually, you know who died. Yeah, I like the way, too, that the book. Well, And I think that when I first saw this show, I felt like the murder was obviously important and it was something we're building to. But the murder became less of a mystery that I was like, I need to know answers because I knew we were going to arrive there. I just became so intrigued in the lives of the characters. That is like one way that I, I do occasionally find myself enjoying a mystery is just like stop trying to guess and just go like, yeah, I'll get there eventually. I'm not going to. It's like you give up on trying to play the game. If I mean, it's like playing on hard mode, right? They're like, again, in any mystery, if they don't give you 
and I think the show does a great job of like you know fainting and and kind of like giving you the wrong indication at times Uh, because like I feel like almost in each episode it could you're like oh it could be this person now and then the next episode yes I do think they're they're playing with you a little bit because they know you're looking out for like violent tendencies violent statements same way that Leanne Moriarty does in the book and every time we see like one of these husbands doing something violent we see Ed kind of courting like violent stuff and like we see you know of course Perry and like all this all this stuff and we see characters talking about how they want to kill people like you know, saying it in an offhand statement, but maybe it's kind of serious. We see fantasies like later on with Jane. Uh, there's there's a line maybe in the first episode where where Madeline says something about how like you know the people in this town or they'll eat you up or something or they'll beat they'll beat you down and then and then Celeste is like yeah to death yeah and you're like whoa dude you know there's kinds of ways that they they're always saying something foreshadowing like, too you know I think the the show does a good job of having like mysterious figures on the on the outside of sort of the main story and you're because I think in the book it's like almost more of a limited pool because in the show there's people that you know by sight that have been involved in the story that you're like you know could have a motive in some way I don't to me I think they they've even had fewer of our main characters show up in those conversations with the with the police like it's been very peripheral characters the show's leaving it that like any of them could have been the ones who died because I think a couple of people might have been uh talking at the end of some of those chapters that that the show is still sort of leaving out there as potential victims but who knows i don't have the best memory <laughs> uh i thought that the, the show did a great job of kind of portraying exactly how the setup happens with with madeline sort of hurting herself and then like having an accident and then jane being introduced in the way that by the way all, all these kids not only do they nail what the book was intending them to be but they're like adorable and like ziggy for example is a character that you're like you, at times you're like, is he capable of hurting a little girl? Is he capable of choking the little girl? And then there's that, that pure innocence where you, you're just like, along with Jane, you're like, there's no way this kid could do this. You know, we know this kid. Yeah, I, I am still fully in there's no way. Uh, the, it, like, I mean, I know in the fourth episode, like she goes to the psych- child psychologist and it seems to kind of like confirm that, yeah, he didn't do it. But we still haven't had it officially confirmed in either book or show but i'm 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 not worried <laughs> i'm like this is not ziggy if you're going to judge a book by its cover he has the, the the maybe a possibility of being someone who could and that's what they're playing with but the, really it's just the effect of like what it sh- what it does to jane which is really sad but like that's what that's why they're leaning into that um i noticed uh, there was a familiar face i spotted i don't know if you if you did one of the one of the kids the eldest daughter no 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 cassie lang no well, i oh. mean yes she's familiar but um I was talking about, um, I believe it is Chloe. No, I don't know the name. It's um, Bonnie, Bonnie's other kid with the new husband. She is the uh, actor who plays Edgin's daughter in the D&D movie we just watched. It's, she looks so familiar. <laughs> I felt like I was like, man, I've seen this person before. <laughs> She's so much younger here. <laughs> so you yeah, know. not somebody, not somebody that I know from this show. But in doing research, Ziggy is young Sheldon. Also, for people who watch Young Sheldon or are interested in Big Bang Theory, yeah, I've seen ads for it. I've never watched an episode of that show, but I've seen some ads. Neither and you're I, right. Yeah. Now that you say that, I'm like, damn, that is that kid. Because <laughs> I saw him and I was like, why? Wow, I feel like this kid has worked since this show, Young Sheldon. So I also think Laura Dern is incredible in the show as Renata. Like, She's great in general. And yeah, I really do. I really dislike Renata. Um, still in the show, dislike her. Maybe she'll be redeemed at some point. I think just as much, maybe more in the show. I don't I still just dislike her. But I, I see the, I see the potential for redemption. And I think maybe they're building for that for her. Um, but then again, like maybe she's the one who kills somebody. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe she's the one who gets killed. I don't know. I'm still I still don't know what I believe happens. Clearly, <laughs> when I watch the show now, um, I look at Laura Dern's performance and like I tried to lead you into this a little bit some last week with the book. And it's just that like you would probably act a little irrational if your daughter had bruising around the neck like someone's doing that. Right. But but, you know, she's leaps to conclusions. She's way over the top. She's her passive aggression is so frustrating. And, but I mean, like we see it from a lot of characters. But like the moment she comes over to uh, to uh, Madeline in the restaurant and is being just super passive aggressive about this whole like party and everything. And I, I, I still am on team Madeline. Although um, I think the show has done a lot to make her less likable than she is in the book. Um, I don't know if we're going to get to some of this in the book. That is the one thing I, like I'll, I'll grant as I'm watching. I'm like, well, this doesn't happen in the book, but maybe it's going to happen. 
Um, and it's just like the order has been changed, but like all this stuff with the, with the production, um, and you know, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit into later episodes, but they do a lot to make her character a little bit less likable. Um, she is of course, you know, way over the top and, and at, you know, again, I think early on, you're like, I don't know if I like her, but the thing I like about her is that she calls people shit. She looks at this this situation, this world she's in, and she recognizes how fucking ridiculous it is. And like the stuff with like the the guy and the um parking guy or whatever the parking the, guy. Yes, thank the, you. Um, I don't even know. He's like a I don't know like a what, what, what's the name of that role? Like a parking attendant, probably parking. He's attendant. like a whatever they do where the drop off. They're like the you know the drop off people that help the kids get out of the cars. Yeah. Like people have taken themselves so fucking seriously and like like you know he's like giving these orders to her and she's like fuck you. Like you don't own me. Like stop. <laughs> like I don't know. I just I like that element of her, but I do recognize that she's over the top and and um, has some very abrasive aspects to her personality. And then yes, I think they're doing some other things as we'll get to that makes her less likable as yeah. we go. Reese Witherspoon is just likable in general. Like That's everything true. I've seen that her in, helps. she's like so <laughs> likable, and and uh, she brings a lot to this role. And like, really, is the the just like the story. She's a lot of what brings this entire cast together, and sort of like uh, she's kind of the linchpin or something. Like yeah, she's... like Celeste and Jane would not be friends if it wasn't for Madeline. I mean, I think the show that's not a secret, but like she is the glue for them because they're probably too different. Um, but with her there, they're able to become friends i think and there's some knowing looks between the two of them i think they both are uh like able to sense that they're the other one is dealing with some things and between who celeste and jane oh celeste and jane yeah the way that they kind of look at each other at times and they're like oh she's a little maybe removed or not you know she seems like distant i did like there was a scene in a later episode where uh celeste and and madeline are having a conversation and celeste definitely gives the vibe of like she knows madeline better than Madeline maybe knows herself. <laughs> yeah, I do want to get back to when Renata came to Madeline and Celeste at that bar because Madeline gives one of the most satisfying get fucks I've ever yeah. heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and it, she's, it, it, she loves to do it in a situation where like all the social taboos say not to do that. Yeah, and and I and I love that she violates that constantly. Right. Like like the entire bar hears it, and it's very dramatic. And that's the other thing is like the drama is so played up for these people, and they're they're vindictive. They're trying to hurt each other, you know, like through their actions and creating the party, and they're playing like politics with people's lives and their child's lives, and they're and they're getting so caught up in their fights that like they're like Madeline's daughter, for example, is like I would rather go to the birthday party than some stupid Disney on Ice thing, and it's it doesn't matter because Madeline's like, well, you're part of the battle. That's the thing that reminds me. We have lords and ladies in their castles, honestly, like going to war with each other. <laughs> and Darby Camp, who plays Chloe, Madeline, and Ed's daughter, is adorable and like well wise beyond her years in such a funny way. And the way she's going to be like a music record label, she's going to start her own record yeah. label and hilarious. And then also the way that she like interacts with other kids almost as an adult. And you can see that she's getting it from Madeline. She's super popular. She's like the linchpin. They're like, oh, yeah. she doesn't come to the party. Like, yeah. Half of the kids aren't going to come. But you can see her getting the, the some of the personality traits from Madeline, too, which is just totally. like really funny. I love yeah, no, that. she's awesome. Um, and I can buy that one kid is really into like classic music and like classic rock and like knows like what she's talking about. But <laughs> we see a couple at least at least um, later on. I think Jane's kid is like singing along to um some like 70s song 60s song and i'm like yeah, great music in this by the way the soundtrack's awesome yeah it's great but like kid that's not what kids are listening to <laughs> no way i was thinking that too i there were at one point they were playing fleetwood mac on the way to the disney on ice thing and i was like and all refusing. the kids are loving it i'm like they would fucking hate this <laughs> yeah they would not want to listen to this at one point i think they're the like uh celeste kids by themselves are watching like jason and the argonauts or some like <laughs> stop motion animated like monster yeah. from back and i was like no fucking way are these yeah. kids interested in that unless unless life is truly that different when you're uh, in that upper wealthy middle class of, of, of you know maybe. that's those are some sophisticated wild rambunctious kids you maybe know? yeah i mean you have that, that fucking party i mean we got a tent and the out in the you know that was it was way over the top too it's it's kind of wild these lives they really leaned into that super wealthy here i don't know if like Maybe people are this rich in the book, and it's just like seeing it really drives it home in yeah. a way. Well, and speaking of seeing it really driving it home, the sexual violence in the show and the violence. Yeah. Seeing it, it's so visceral, and it's so much more upsetting to me than, than the book. Did you know Skarsgård was going to be violent when you first watched this? Because like I already knew from the book, but I'm watching him, and I'm just like, 
I don't know. Like I, I was sitting there thinking, like you had to know that there was violence with this guy. Yeah, I mean, I think I knew he was like dangerous. I didn't know how far that show would take it. I, I will. This show takes it pretty far. Like in terms of violence and sexual violence, I've seen in shows like this goes pretty far. So I wouldn't say that I was predicting that it would go, that it would turn out the way that it is. Definitely not. I thought you were going to say for a second that that you were like, gl- what is it called? Like glamoring or gl- like being glamored by a by a vampire where like you're like tricked oh, into like <laughs> where I didn't think he was. Gonna yeah, be- I thought you were going to say like, oh, I didn't think he was going to do anything because he's just so. Oh, no, I was like this. I mean, I know from the book, but like I just felt like from his performance, there was a lurking danger there. So dark. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I still like he's a mysterious character like we've talked about. Yeah. Um, did you think that we'd see these depictions or did you think we'd get some fade to black kind of stuff? Well, you mentioned that, you know, last week that this was the sharp objects guy. And so, um, the track record from that is, yeah, we'll probably see some pretty dark shit because that show didn't, didn't shy away from anything and very, and, and darker source material, honestly, than even this. It's affecting. And it, I think it's also one of those things where it raises awareness. I think I can't remember for sure, but there may be even like a, like a hotline, Sort of like war- like not warning, but just in general. I like, didn't catch that, but I believe you know that might be maybe at the end yet. of the show or so there's some. I, I want to say that there's something about like domestic abuse or something. I do like think that. that's I do think that's smart when when the shows do that. Me too. This is so difficult to watch, and I can totally understand if this is something that's that's too real to you to to kind of bounce off of it. But I also think that people are really willing. I, art is affecting in the way that people are willing to ignore some of the atrocities in life. Uh, without engaging with them. And I think like having art like this forces people to, you know, understand how, how bad it can be out there. Totally. And like, I know that there's a lot of discourse around trigger warnings and content warnings and like all this stuff. And it's, it, again, I, I still don't think that like we should be censoring the art and say that, oh, you can't ever talk about these subjects. But like the other side of it is like, if you've ever actually been around somebody when they watch something that sends them into a spiral it's scary and like you feel like I feel terrible and you can see why you know it's like well, yeah this is really dark shit and if it's really if it's if it hits too close to home for people um it ruins the watching experience for them it's like they can't enjoy it anymore and I get it you know and and so at the very least like a little heads up sometimes is nice um but you know it's it's tricky and I know and I I don't know what the answers are I'm not gonna pretend to but uh, I can see why the, the debate is an ongoing one. Right. So moving into the second episode here is called Serious Mothering. Perry lashes out at Celeste when he discovers he missed orientation at the school, but she lets it slide. Jane looks for work with little success. Madeline goes on the warpath against Renata upon learning Ziggy was not invited to Amabella's birthday party. Madeline's husband, Ed, questions her devotion to him when she continues to complain about seeing Nathan with Bonnie all the time, and Madeline is further disturbed when Bonnie takes Abigail to Planned Parenthood. Nathan tries to come to a peaceful resolution with Ed about their parenting of Abigail, but Ed senses Nathan is trying to intimidate him and stands firm. Madeline's younger daughter, Chloe, and Bonnie's daughter, Skye, attempt to mend the wounds between Ziggy and Amabella. But it leads to Ziggy kissing Amabella and causing an incident. The parents of the four children are called into the principal's office, leading Jane to have a flashback of an unwanted sexual encounter. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of these, uh, you know, other characters we haven't got a chance to touch on here. This is a, a, a moment where Ed and Nathan have a big confrontation. Adam Scott as Ed. Uh, he's great. And, uh, uh, you know, most of my exposure to him has been through Parks and Rec, but I know he's in... Um, He's in what Severance now. Severance is excellent, yeah. by the way. One of the better shows for last year. Yeah, yeah, which I need to watch. That's that's one of those shows I've been wanting to get to. Um, and like I, I like him just to kind of inherently from what I've seen him in. He seems like a likable dude. Um, and I like Ed. He's the, he tends to be the the dad that I you know sort of empathize with the most. And 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 um, I don't know, like I feel most akin to. Yeah, I relate to. Um, and I just his little his interaction with Nathan is so great. Um, I like the way he he handled that, and then it's it's funny to see the fallout of it, where everybody's like, "Oh my god, I can't believe he threatened Nathan. He's a psycho. He's trying. He wants to beat him up, and all this stuff." And it, yeah, it's like definitely kind of an overreaction to what was actually said. But but still, I don't know. It's it's just a really interesting interaction. Ed's different in the show than he is in the book, um, and they they added more elements to him. They add he's like a more rounded out character to me. Uh, maybe we'll get some more of that in the book as we continue to read. I don't know, but 
Um, I like what they're doing with that, though. They made him like a, a really interesting part of the of the show. I really like the way he um, stands up for himself with Madeline and like understandably is kind of pissed off that she's so obsessed with her previous marriage and Nathan and like, you know, relitigating yeah. that. All these characters that they introduce, some of them we like more than others. And then as time goes on throughout the show, most of them are flawed. And I, you know, I think it's a cool way to show that like everyone's flawed. And also like you can root for somebody who has, you know, good intentions and who is a good person, even through bad mistakes or like even like Ed is like, that's like something light that, you know, some would say is going too far. I don't think he was going too far, but then obviously their reaction to it. And you see that Nathan that power dynamic is clear that Nathan was the type of guy that probably would have bullied Ed or whatever he was talking about. And, and Ed, people do harbor this kind of stuff throughout their lives and, and time people change as time goes on. But, you know, thinking about standing up for yourself in, in, in the past, I feel like everybody can empathize with, empathize with something like that, like wanting to have, you know, stood up for yourself or done something different at a younger age. I like to think that that's a little bit of Madeline rubbing off on him too, right? Like she's the kind of person who doesn't take shit from anybody. So I like to see him not taking shit from nathan here <laughs> yeah i and then like seeing bonnie um as a character too like yeah i you empathize with so much of what these characters i feel do. like we haven't got a lot with her she's still kind of mysterious yeah. to me at this point but we do see more and we get the the thing where she says to ed like you know everybody's got other stuff going on and like clearly kind of like leading us to believe there's more going on than than what we've seen so far seems like it there was that conversation with nathan that we definitely don't get and like because in the books we basically only get madeline jane and celeste and only the things that they are like people they're interacting with so we don't see ed and nathan having a conversation off to the side we don't see ed and Bonnie having a conversation off to the side. This is the kind of stuff that I like that we're getting to see in the show. So the idea of someone feeling like they they can't necessarily talk to their parent and they find somebody who can help them with something like going to Planet Parenthood, which is a responsible thing to do and something that like, you know, we you would want to advocate for. But you can also totally understand Madeline being like, what the fuck? Call me and tell me at least. And uh, so like all these characters, they're doing things that they think are right. And, you know, Bonnie signs this petition because she thinks that it's, you know, maybe not great for the community to see this Avenue Q play, which we can talk about a little bit. This like puppet simulating having sex. It's funny because it's like, I don't know what the fuck this thing's about, like still. But like, yeah, it's interesting. While we're on it, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Basically, is it a real play? Avenue Q. Yeah. The theatrical production that Madeline is working on uh, is a real musical and as described in the show, really performed with puppets. The the real Avenue Q had a very successful Broadway run from 2003 to 2009 and won the so-called Triple Crown of Tony Awards, Best Musical, Best Book of a Musical, and Best Original Score in 2004. The New York production moved to the off-Broadway New World stages in 2009, where as of August 2017, it has been running ever since. Although the show contains puppets, it was never intended for children. So given all the awards, critical acclaim, and financial success garnered by the musical over the years in the context of Big Little Lies, Renata's objections are meant to be seen as baseless and vindictive. Mm. Yeah. So it's like they're saying like, oh, it has puppets in it so for kids. It's like it's like saying like an animated film is for kids inherently and being like, well, no, that's not the audience. Yeah. I wasn't clear on who the audience was, but you're yeah, this is just a, this is this is a thing made for adults. Right. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't know. I thought they were just they invented some play and there's all these weird elements and puppets. And I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> that's that's cool to hear that it's a real one. I mean, I'm totally on Madeline's side here. You know, like I'm, I'm not I'm against that kind of censorship. Um, and which has, of course, become a very hot button issue in the years following this show. And which, you know, like even now, I feel like even um, seems more applicable to today as we're seeing things trying to be censored and books taken off of shelves and bannings and, and all kinds of shit. Um, it w- ostensibly for protecting the kids, which, you know, often is a bullshit thing that people hide behind. And not to mention, like, we read Fahrenheit 451 years ago now. Yeah. And, you know, I fucking hate every time I feel like we're inching ever closer to something like that. I just can't believe that people, you know, they're, yeah. I don't know, can't see the forest through the trees or something. And they just like the censorship. I, I, you know, I just have to mention, I think it's hilarious that I heard that, like, the Bible was banned in some schools in Utah or something. Yeah. <laughs> like, I also heard you that. You know, content violations based on what they're, I was like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. 
li- someone like put a list of all the things that appear in this book. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, episode two, it was cool because I felt like episode one did a great job of setting everything up. And then at the end of episode one, we get like the big conflict at the school. And then episode two really starts to get the ball rolling as far as like what's going to happen. One thing that's almost a faint or at least it's a faint until later in the show, maybe we're going to come back. is like the f- first episode ends on a like unnamed detective looking like pensive and like looking at the grass and like looking at these houses and like it it made it feel like it was setting up a show where I'm like that's not really what this show is and so it was interesting it was like they were trying to like kind of bring everybody in they're like oh you, you want to see a you know police procedural maybe you'll get some of that here you know like yeah. <laughs> but I mean also it does it pays off those those clips that we see of like get party guests from the trivia night who are right speaking to the police and yeah. which I have to make sense of that we see we still see her taking notes and stuff every now and then like looking like who knows what's going on in her head I love yeah. the idea of getting to play a character like this by the way if I was to be if I was an actor which I'm not I would love to be the like the the lighter flicking detective that's like rolling up and looking at clues <laughs> yeah, and yeah, stuff right. like I'm like that's such a that's such a fun role to, to get to play just look mysterious is usually the <laughs> the performance yeah um yeah so in this episode we get some of the stuff that goes on with um Ziggy kissing Amabella and then all uh, Renata and her husband and then Jane and her husband end up in the and I think even Bonnie Bonnie and um, her husband also end up in, in the principal's office and they're all kind of talking about oh yeah it's like a big group you're right the characters are played off each other there and we get to see Renata kind of flying off the handle again um, and the way that like you know Jane is reacting to her son possibly committing a an unwanted sexual encounter yeah and talk about triggering and stuff like we're seeing it in these characters we're seeing it in jane because like everything like this is is they don't know people who like who are around her don't know it's happening but they're bringing up shit from her past that is incredibly triggering for her yeah and so she's dealing with all kinds of stuff that is you know way heavier than they even realize when they're doing this which is why like you got to be careful and not jump to conclusions like Renata constantly does. <laughs> yeah. Well, like to quote Bonnie, like you never know. Everybody's got stuff going on. You know, you have to kind of pick your battles and see like what is worth, you know, dust creating a dust up over and what is like something that you think is like completely by accident. And yeah, this whole Ziggy, Amabella, Chloe thing that's like kind of, you, you know. There, you can see it from both perspectives at almost every time there's a scenario that pops up. You're like you're hearing from Amabella that she's she says like nothing's going on and that Ziggy's her friend and then you're also hearing that you're seeing her reaction to the teacher right so I, I know I know why they don't do this in the show but like in real life if this was me I would want Amabella to tell me what happened <laughs> like nobody says like actually tell me what happened like what led up to it what was said like because to me it was always just like he choked me. Like, it's there's no, like, context for anything. And if Amabella has, like, nothing to say about it, then you maybe start to see, like, oh, maybe maybe this is not true. Like, and, like, Renata doesn't talk to Amabella in a way that we see, at least. She just hears the words and then leaps, you know, flies off the handle. Um, and I know they're six, so it's hard. It's like they might not be able to really convey it, but... Well, it's clear that Amabella is experiencing some sort of trauma and yeah. that she she Something doesn't happened. want to she doesn't want to speak about it. So that's like getting her to tell you isn't isn't as easy as just asking. And maybe it wouldn't be, but I, yeah, I just think in real life, I think there needs to be some more follow-up questions. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> that, yeah. That, that they instead just leap right to accusations. Um, but uh, one other thing I want to bring up in this episode is I, this is where I started noticing really... There's like a, a real dramatic flair for um, these transitions uh, between scenes. Uh, I think the one that caught me was I can't remember which characters it was, but someone like starts to scream and like frustration and it transitions to someone who is like doing a way more aggressive scream for a different reason. And so there's this weird momentary blend where it has this strange effect on me. I think Celeste was screaming and then it transitions to Jane screaming. Yeah. And it goes and it like takes it up a notch. I don't know. It's it's interesting. It has this weird effect where you're like not sure who did the scream and at what intensity. Yeah. Um yeah. Bringing up the transitions is a great a great point. And one that something that I was noticing a lot was the beginning and endings of these of these episodes are having this like weird bl- raising or lowering to black of some kind. And I think that it's uh something that'll be revealed later. Possibly. 
but it's like kind of this, you know, keep an eye on that and like try to figure out what you think that is. Cause I think every episode opens and closes like that. This sort of like vignette. Interesting. Well, it has a similar effect to the ocean, right? Like the tumbling of the waves. There's a lot of chaos sometimes in these transitions where we'll get a couple chaotic transitions where we see images. There's this moment, I think it gets introduced here, where we see um, Jane running on the beach, chasing after some some like footsteps that disappear. And then she's jogging and it's it's flipping back and forth and flipping to wherever she is. And sometimes these transitions can get kind of disorienting like i'm like what's even going on it gets kind of chaotic and it just made me think of like tumbling in a wave like it, it felt it felt like that i really like the way that they are able to like articulate her experiencing her trauma in ways like the way that she's running and she's kind of the all these f- constant flashbacks because i feel like she she even says this in the show is like it's something that she knows she'll never forget none of, she, like, she thinks about this basically every day and the way that like we're seeing her running on this beach Um, clearly after the encounter and then also like when she's running in general, she's kind of running, you know, running off her demons or whatever, you know, those, those kinds of things that she's dealing with and the music playing a part in it. Definitely in the next couple episodes, we get more into that. But, um, I think this is a good opportunity to talk about Jane, which we haven't really talked about her much and, um, Shailene Woodley's performance, which I think is a good one. Um, I I love, there's a line in the first episode that is one of my favorites in the book where she says, she reveals, she's like, oh, sometimes I, I'm in somewhere like now, like at this cafe, at this beautiful beachside, and she has this feeling of like, I wish I were here. Um, and I love that because I've definitely felt that way at times. And I think a lot of people can can recognize that. And maybe it has to do with depression, something I have struggled with in the past. And maybe, I don't know, or maybe that's just a, a universal experience or like momentary depression, but like feeling like you can't connect with your present and you 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 feel like it doesn't belong to you. You don't belong there. Um, that's a very real feeling that I think um, she's tapping into there, and it's something that I don't seem talked about a lot. Um, and you know, it's kind of a momentary line, but like I, I, that's a it's early on with her character introduction. It makes me connect with her as like a very thoughtful person. Right. Yeah. No, I find myself having not like you know I'm not going to say anything close to this level of trauma or anything like that, but. There, there are times where you feel like from the perspective of someone who's very introspective and thinks about these sort of things. And it's I think it's a mixture of anxieties and also depression because it's like disassociating at times or even like um, like, you know, coming to maybe it's, you know, let's just say that I have a lot of things that <laughs> I'm still unpacking. But but in terms <laughs> of like you do something that you think will bring you joy and it doesn't necessarily hit the cur- what you what you're expecting and the way that like, you know, you can see others like really living in the moment and enjoying themselves. And that's what I think that she's nailing here. And yeah, expertly written. Yeah. She's also feeling like an like an outsider at this moment. Right. Like she's new to town. So, of course, she doesn't feel quite at home yet. So I think there's there's definitely that element going on, too. Yeah, I, I thought that was really profound. Yeah, totally, man. Um, yeah, and Jane Jane is really kind of the heart of the show. Um, as much it's like Madeline and Jane are, are, are really, and of course Celeste, but like you really boil it down. She's like the emotional core in a, in a way, and she's our entry point once again to the situation because she's not from this this world. Whereas Madeline kind of serves as more of a, a mentor, someone who is very plugged into this world. Um. So, yeah, I, I mean, I like that. I, we're, as we get into episode three, but we're talking about transitions, I want to go ahead and jump to it. I posted on our Instagram, I caught this um, transition where um, it's during one of these kind of more chaotic moments where we're seeing a lot of different scenes, but um, she's laying in bed. I think this is during the during the attack or after the attack, and she's looking, and then, like, we see in her actual eye, it, trans- it starts to transition to this scene of her i think it's her standing at the ocean's edge and i i posted it to our instagram it's like they they put it in her eye and i thought that was really cool right like because this would have been before this happened so it's like her um, like seeing the future i was kind of drawing something a little different um, yeah what, what was what was your read on that you know what moment i'm talking about yeah so it's okay. just th- that's the moment that she's actually being assaulted i believe right or maybe that's right what after it's meant meant to be uh, she's laying on the bed she's laying on the bed yeah it's kind of that future she soon after this runs down the beach and then she drops her clothes and walks in and and i take that to be sort of like a rebirth or like a like a wanting to feel clean and cleansed and and, so is she picturing herself doing that she's feeling like in this moment she's kind of lost something like something's been taken from her 
and and then like I think she's maybe envisioning this sort of rebirth that she like and and I know rebirth is like a weird way to term that but like she's going to run into the ocean and f- want to feel cleansed and hopefully be, f- be free of it yeah be free of it yeah yeah cuz it does feel like uh she's running away but she's also finding an escape so so yeah i mean i i obviously like i feel like i feel like we're going to return to this it seems like a motif that we're going to return to so i haven't seen the end of it yet but um I am intrigued to see where they're going with this because we don't, I, I, I don't know whose footsteps they are yet. That's the one I, cause at one point it looks like she's running after the guy, but then at other times it's like she's running after herself. I'm not sure. And maybe, maybe they've shown it both ways. It's like shoe footprints too. And she's barefoot. So yeah, we're not really yeah, sure. Or is it like a, is it like a, a, an idea of a man that she would have wanted because she seems like she's chasing him, but, or is she chasing him out of anger and she's going to hunt him down? Like, because it, it was beginning the, the fourth episode, I think they're leaning heavily on maybe she's the one who murders somebody. Um, it seemed like the, that was what the fourth episode was really leaning into. Yeah, and I think that the way that she um, this this running that she's doing and this want for for like you know rebirth or a new beginning or something like that with going into the water, uh, it's clear that that's what she wants. But then we see the character after this, obviously still very much dealing with so much. Yeah. Uh, from from the you know this traumatic experience. So it wasn't like she was able to completely unburden herself. Yeah. Right. So episode three is called Living the Dream. Perry chokes Celeste when he believes she deliberately left him out of a family gathering. Celeste threatens to leave him. Renata's party for Amabella is a success, but she is ultimately upset when Madeline invited Amabella's closest friends and Ziggy to Disney on Ice on the same day. At therapy, Perry claims his outbursts are out of fear that Celeste does not love him, which Celeste attempts to deny. When Abigail's academic performance begins to decline, her guidance counselor suggests it is being caused by stress at home, so she decides to live with Nathan, much to Madeline's dismay. Jane gets Ziggy involved with more extracurricular activities and helps him construct a family tree for school with Madeline's help. However, Jane opposes Ziggy's insistence on putting his father's name on the tree, and she ultimately confides to Madeline that Ziggy was the result of rape by a man named Saxon Banks whom she has not seen since. Big episode. Uh, one of the most dramatic ones, I think, um, between, yeah, Celeste and Perry, that that interaction with the therapist. So interesting. I was so shocked. Um, it makes sense in retrospect. I was shocked to see him actually admit to what was going on, at least to some capacity. I didn't think he was going to. But then, yeah, like, I, talk about a great performance, uh, again, from Nicole Kidman. The look on her face while he is, like, making this all about him and how he's such, he just loves her so much. He's so worried she's going to leave him. She could have any man. How, you know, I, I'm just so lucky to have her. And I get so, I just love her so much that I get so passionate. And like the look on her face is like, this is a complete lie. And she's worried. I think rightfully that the therapist is going to believe it. I, I want to give the therapist a little more credit than that. And she seems to be a little wiser than that. As we as we're, as we're continuing on, um, it's clear that this therapist has taken on the role of you know a different character in the book that we've seen. Like they've kind of combined a few different therapist type characters together, which I think is smart just for economy. Yeah, I remember being so shocked the first time I saw this that he was willing to say anything. I thought he was going to almost be like silent in these therapy sessions. Yeah, because he said like he grabbed her shoulder or something. And that was like the way he like kind of like started to reveal what happened. And, then and as the conversation him. goes on, he they both basically say that it's more than that and it's more often than that. And yeah, I think that like you said, the therapist is well aware of what's happening here and just trying to figure out how to navigate this to get the correct information to Celeste, I think. And I thought they were going to lie because in the book sets me up for that because in the book she says they go to these these couples counseling. Well, she she goes to a domestic violence counseling. Later, but I'm saying when she's talking about going to the counseling with Perry, she says they go in there and they just want the cup, the counselor to guess. And when they don't guess, then they never reveal it. And that's why it hasn't worked in the past. So I was surprised to see the change here and have him actually reveal anything. Yeah. I, I read that Skarsgård and Kidman didn't rehearse these these scenes so that they were like very awkward and raw and like off the cuff kind of uh, between them. Oh, interesting. So they didn't know what each other were going to say. I think most importantly, well, they, I think they knew what they were going to say because they've seen the script. But in terms of the way that they were acting within the scene and kind of playing off each oh. other, you see like Nicole Kidman's looks that she's giving him, and like again the way that he his body language, like he's leaning his, forward. Exactly. It seems like he's kind of charming, trying to charm the therapist a little bit too. Yeah, 
That's really interesting. I haven't heard. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm total novice to all this stuff, but I love hearing about performance and like all the stuff that goes into scenes and how actors are able to get certain chemistry and certain things on screen. It's really fascinating to me. Like, I know there's a whole artistry behind it that I think people either like wait, spend way too much time thinking about <laughs> or they completely ignore like, but it's so important, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody has their own method, right? Like you get literal method acting and you get people who, yeah. you know, there's some of the best actors out there that are, that don't take themselves seriously in any way. And they're like, yeah, I just walk in and I act. But I mean, like situation like this, like just specifically for this scene, like what went into getting what we ended up seeing is just really fascinating to me. It's like preparation, of course, almost in any any industry or anything that you do form of art. And whose idea was that? Was it the director? Did the director say, I don't want you to rehearse any of this to try and get a certain kind of performance because that's the kind of stuff you could see a director actually asking actors to do that's it's just really interesting yeah uh he said that he appreciated it because he and nicole kidman had genuine tension and awkwardness um who said that? trying to read each other's emotions that's what scars scar scar yeah yeah i get it so yeah. i don't know who came up with it but you know clearly he feels that it helped that's cool man we see more acts of violence like initially we see that one outburst and then this time we see like the choking and then a couple other things where you're like this is terrible like this is really bad and they put it all on screen for us in a way that this is all at a remove a little bit in the book it's it's celeste like remembering things that have happened her complex feelings about it is one of the best parts like of of the book that i like i love her hearing her trying to talk to herself and be like why she's conflicted and how she feels complicit in some ways, even though I don't think I don't think she should. But like, I love that we see that interaction happen and we see the way they fight each other and how when they have sex, she seems to be kind of into it. And like, that is a really weird, complex thing. And like, she knows that that is muddying the waters for herself and how she feels about it. Um, because it's clear that she does like have genuine affection for him. And we see that, you know, with their 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 FaceTime call or whatever they have. And like they it's just a really fucking strange relationship. And it does a good job at showing how even abusive relationships like you can see why they no two are created the same way and how people have complex reasons to stay and why it's so difficult to 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 break them off. This is an extreme example, and this is a very realistic depiction of that as well. Like this happens, but like toxic relationships happen all the time and people stay together and they have attractions to each other. So like you said, it is kind of, there's not a, you know, one size fits all for any relationship. Like ultimately, like I think in most cases, toxic relationships don't work out and like you, you want to see both parties kind of break it off and find something more healthy. But um yeah, I mean, it gets really way more complex when you have kids and you're married and like, the, you know, maybe it's a progression too. like this things yeah, compound over true. time and get worse. And yeah, it's there's no simple answers here. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't I definitely hope I don't come off like I'm saying that, you know, I've just I'm just impressed at the complexity they're able to put on screen. I think it's very interesting and compelling. So um, some lighter stuff. They go to Disney on Ice. We've kind of addressed this yeah. already. Uh, the birthday party happens. Take a fucking limousine with champagne when you're in kindergarten to a birthday like this is yeah. this, this is another world <laughs> yeah excess that's a lot of excess <laughs> yeah. going on something that i felt is as another through line that i think they expanded on in the show that i that i thought you know it hurts a lot as somebody who hasn't gone through something like this haven't hasn't had children yet but you, you think of like your children getting older and making decisions in, in the case of abigail wanting to live with with nathan who you know that happens in the book but in this case, like you kind of see like the things building up with the home life and the way that she's like uh, interested in hanging out with Bonnie and Nathan. And she gets some of the freedom that she doesn't necessarily get under under um, Madeline and, you know, pros and cons. Right. Like, you know, it's uh, it's nice to have freedom as a kid, but sometimes you want that structure and, and she wants her to go to college and she's thinking maybe college isn't for me and that's valid. But there's there's a certain decisions that you make uh, growing up that, you know, do affect you going forward. It's really interesting. Abigail, Abigail is a more rounded character here that I that I found that I empathized with more. I think she's doing a really good job of showing the like really awkward position she's put in in this relationship. Um, 
between between all these parents you know <laughs> yeah the love that madeline and, and abigail share still too like abigail makes a point to say eventually like you're my mom she's more of like a best friend kind of you know role model yeah and it, it, there there was a, a maybe in the same moment but like um her and her mother are having this really kind of touching moment and then chloe comes out and joins in at the at the piano and it, it felt like they showed abigail kind of drift off and I don't know that it's jealousy, but I think there's a sense of like Chloe is her and Ed's kid, her mother and Ed's kids. So so she is like she feels more natural to this situation and makes Abigail feel like an outsider. I don't think she blames anybody for this, but I think that that's part of the problem is she feels like an outsider in some ways because she has this connection to Nathan who is the enemy, like Madeline has basically labeled him an enemy and that's her dad. So she's trying to like, not let that be the case. And so she's defending Bonnie. She's defending Nathan to some extent. Um, and then, yeah, you know, you get this really, I think the grass is greener a little bit for Abigail where she thinks she's going to like her life better when she moves in with Nathan and Bonnie. I'll be curious to see how that actually plays out. We get a hint of it in the fourth episode where she's like leaving the house and not listening to Nathan at all. Um, and it just it's sad because I think it's a very real situation where she probably doesn't feel at, at home in either place. Yeah, I mean, it's again, these are these are real scenarios that don't have easy answers. Like who who knows what is best for a child in this scenario? Like um, and again, like, should she go to college? Should she not? Should she pursue something else? It's like these are all really, really difficult questions to answer uh, when a kid's coming up. And, you know, I, I can also totally see Madeline's point of view of losing her daughter, you know, like, like not, not living in the same house with somebody changes the dynamic of a relationship like that. And I did, I did like the moment where once Madeline's kind of accepted it, she's hopeful that she and, and Abigail can have some of that girlfriend time that, that sort of Bonnie and, and she, um, Abigail had before. So. Yeah. The whole idea that Madeline is like a little different in the show. She is very overbearing at times with Abigail. She's very like, this is the way it is. Let me tell you about, what you need to do for your future and college. And she, she totally barrels over her when she's with the principal or, or whoever that teacher is, when she's having that conversation, like doesn't let her talk. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's that kind of stuff. I like, I felt like was played up a lot more than it was in the book, at least um, to where I, I'm finding it more difficult to be fully on Madeline's side in the show. But um, yeah. I, that's the point. Right. But I speaking as somebody who I'm sure was a like difficult person to raise you know I think my parents had it tough because I was very much like this rebellious kind of teenager that would talk back and say crazy shit and like was very opinionated um you know it can't be easy you know it's also like she Abigail is not a saint of a of a you know of a child totally. she's you know she definitely says shit that's not fair and is mean and like all that yeah yeah so moving into episode four, episode four is called Push Comes to Shove. Abigail moves in with Nathan and Bonnie. Celeste legally represents Madeline and theater director Joseph Bachman in a meeting with the mayor regarding the controversial Avenue Q and successfully persuades the mayor to allow the play to proceed. In the process, Celeste realizes her desire to return to work. She asks her therapist, Dr. Reisman, how to best convince Perry, but Dr. Reisman is more concerned why she is afraid to do so. At home, Perry tells Celeste not to attend any future meetings. When she refuses, he grabs her by the throat, but quickly relinquishes when one of their boys enters the room. Joseph and Madeline kiss, and they are revealed to have had an affair a year ago. I forget if they're like, some people call her Madeline and some people call her Madeline. And I feel like some people are saying it incorrectly on purpose. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, Renata I noticed it. you said it, you said Madeline and, uh, yeah. and I was like, I think that's the way Renata says it. And I think she's mispronouncing yeah. it. Maybe on purpose, or maybe just shows that she doesn't care to like say it correctly. Yeah, Madeline. Yeah, uh, locates a man online whom she believes to be Jane's rapist. She informs Jane and Celeste, and they plan to travel to San Luis Obispo to confront him. Miss Barnes, the kid's teacher, suspects Amabella is still being bullied, despite Amabella's assertions that she and Ziggy are friends. Miss Barnes convinces Jane to have Ziggy psychologically evaluated. The psychologist believes that Ziggy is innocent and may in fact be being bullied himself. Okay, so we've talked about some of the stuff in this episode already, so I won't touch on that, but uh, I want to focus on a few things we haven't. Um, for one, the, the, the revelation about this potential affair sounds like it is an affair that has been going on. 
Um, that that I, I thought maybe they were playing towards something like this. This is one of the biggest changes. Now, I again, I don't know if this happens later in the book. So based off of my read of the first half of the book, none of this is in there. Um, and I was surprised. Um, it changes the way I feel about Madeline. Um, because this is a pretty shitty thing to do to Ed. And um, I don't think he deserves it. I can see why it happened. You know, if I'm like being fully empathetic. Um, clearly, Madeline loves this side of herself that she has unlocked by becoming involved in this production. She even talks about it with Celeste. Like I, it, it, like I felt like I was something other than just a mom. You can see that that's important to her. And I think the guy gets sort of caught up in that feeling. And so that escape and like, you can kind of see how something like this would happen, but it shows to me also a lack of restraint and a lack of respect for the relationship you're in with Ed. Um, and because I like Ed, that frustrates me. So, yeah. 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 It's not, again, it's dirty. It's, you know, it's life can take these turns and people are flawed. And it's interesting to, th- to think of like David Kelly and Jean Marc Vallée looking at the character of Madeline in the book and saying, like, we need some flaws here. Like, we need to kind of twist the twist the story up some more and, and thinking of this is the way to go. And like you said, it, it, it will be interesting to see how it plays out from here. Um, that's, what, yeah. that's what I'll say about it. Uh, so one other thing I'll add to that. Um, speaking of Ed, there's another moment. Um, he was this episode or the previous one where he has this weird interaction with Bonnie and she comes out and he's like, I just love sweaty women or something. Like he says something very weird. And he, he like also kind of checks out another woman walk by. And I, I can tell they're leaning into the idea of like everybody's eyes wander here. Um, tr- oh, I think it's I think it's partially has to do with the fact that he and they've said this multiple times from his point of view and her point of view that they're not having sex. Madeline and Ed aren't having sex. So he's like agreed. So he's I think maybe, it's supposed to be like he's all pent up and he's got to look at women in weird ways and be a creep. The show is trying to underscore just how attractive Bonnie is. I think like repeatedly, like all the all the husbands at the party are uh, ogling her like even even Ed gets caught up in it. Right. Um, I think they're trying to lean into that. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that moment. We'll see how it plays out. But again, I, I, I agree. I think they're trying to add flaws to all these characters. They want to make sure we don't like Ed. We don't just fully like Ed. Because otherwise, up to this point, we have liked Ed pretty much. You know, he hasn't done much wrong. Yeah, and I don't necessarily dislike him for this. He didn't. I mean, it was just a weird thing to say. He probably shouldn't have said that. Um, I think he realizes that. Um, you know, and I'm not going to blame somebody for looking at somebody like I, I don't think that's, you know, whatever. I'm not personally going to get that up on your high horse about purity. Like, don't even look at another woman, you know, like, and I'm not going to get sure, that. sure. He's just being a little bit of a creep. And I think it's like I said, I, my read on it was that he, they were trying to depict this like he's a little unhappy as well. And maybe this is why, like, um, you know, Madeline would go as far as to linger in the marriage and, you know, seek uh, comfort or seek pleasure elsewhere and maybe he's like thinking about it but hasn't taken that step well and maybe you're right maybe it shows like uh it's the effect of like yeah if she's not fulfilling the intimacy per part of their marriage not fulfilling in a way like it's a requirement but like if if he feels like he isn't getting that even ed who we like so much trust you know trustworthy steady eddie as he calls himself maybe his eye will start to wander right um, so yeah, I mean, it's just interesting and, and, um, I don't know. I, I feel conflicted about the moment, but I see why it's in there. Um, what else have we not talked about from this episode? Uh, the, the, the negotiation with the mayor, very dramatic. Yeah, great, great scene. Love this. Uh, love seeing Celeste just like put Renata and the mayor and everybody in her, in their place. Time to just... shine. She, and she does. And we can see that she loves it. And I thought maybe I was like, oh, please tell, tell Madeline what's going on, but she doesn't. So I, I'm convinced it will happen at some point. To talk about Celeste in that scene too, the way that she, they're walking in and the the theater director runs up and he's like, we shouldn't do this. And she's like, I'll keep it civil. Like she basically says like, I'll handle it. It won't be a blow up situation where we, we no longer have a good relationship with the ca- city council and all this stuff. And at one point in the argument, and this is like, again, just such a credit to Nicole Kidman's performance. She like, I believe even someone who's seen it before that she was going to basically just be like, oh, the mayor's right. But she's playing it. She's letting them say all this stuff. And she's like, you know, you're right about this and you're right about that. But 
the law is not on your side and da, da, da. she like flips it on him really quickly. And I just thought that was just such a fun way to to play that. And, and um, yeah, shuts it down, shuts down Renata and stands by exactly what she said. Like she said she would handle yeah. it and she did. And she knows that Madeline's going to make things worse. So she's like a couple of times she has Madeline like stop talking because <laughs> Madeline is like going to throw a bomb. Like you could tell that's how Madeline's going to respond to most things. So it's, it, you know, seeing this, such a capable person like this, like Celeste, and then seeing like what she's going through in her home life yeah. and, and the, like the, how difficult that can be to confront is is wild. And this was the part of their relationship I got to see that really underscores the darkness and the, the maybe some of the reasons, at least, um, that's going on with Perry in the sense that he is controlling because we see him getting mad when he is like looking and he sees her suit that she's prepared. And when he gets a hint that maybe she's going to like do more than just one meeting and the idea of her possibly being interested in being a lawyer again is so infuriating to him. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we can start to see the real shitty side of this guy. I mean, like obviously the violence is shitty, but like for na- like up till now, we haven't really understood where it's coming from. And now we start to see maybe that's this super controlling it's not because he's worried about this isn't because he's worried about her leaving him it has nothing to do with it. He wants to control her. And that's where you can see the lie that he told the therapist, I guess, is what I'm getting at. You know, I think it was a it was a nice relief when we got some semblance of uh, confirmation that Ziggy might not have been bullying Amabella. Yeah, I am. I am uh, convinced that it's not him. And this is just this lines up with my worldview. So I'm I'm down for that. Um, I did think it was funny this episode really leaned into like violent fantasies. I think this is the one where we see her like shoot a guy who's breaking into her house and then it's like revealed it was like a fantasy and like, you know, she jumps off the cliff at the end of the episode, I think. So it's like, is she going to be violent towards someone else herself? You know, there's a lot. It seems like there's a lot of potential for violence in Jane, which is setting her up to be a potential person who um, is going to be the one who either commits the violence or is the victim, I guess. I don't know. I guess from here, we should start to have you do some speculation. I want to hear, uh, you know, w- next episode, we're going to be covering the second half of the book and the second half of the show. Yeah, I don't want to get into too much speculation because I- I've done it throughout somewhat. And like, I just don't know. And, and I because I don't have a victim, I can't come up with a motive. I can't come up with what sort of crime it is. They even have implied that maybe it wasn't a murder. Like, th- it's unclear. There's a, just a body. And like, I th- here's one thing I do think. I think someone goes down the stairs. There's this really long set of stairs that they multiple times make, an, make a point of showing to us. They even have her like lifting the the the, the it's like tape across it uh, for whatever reason. She uh, Madeline has to go through it. I think they've. I think there's a reason, and I think it's someone gets pushed down the stairs. So that's going to be my guess as for what happens, who it is. I don't know. Well, so like outside of like the major reveals, is there anything else that you want to predict as far as like the story going forward? Do you think like, you know, we're going to see uh, like what are, how is this dinner going to go that they have coming up? Do we have like what, you know, supposedly Madeline found Jane's rapist? Like, is this going to go somewhere? Yeah, like, that's really strange to me. I didn't think he was going to get involved, but now it seems like he is like in, the, in that summary you read. It's like, oh, they decided to go see him. I was like, oh, I didn't know that was decided, but OK. Um, <laughs> they plan to. Um, they plan. To. Yeah. yeah. Whether or not they do or not, I don't know. But like, I can't imagine he's at the party later because then he would become someone who I think might die. But um, maybe he shows up. I don't know. Um, that's the potential. I'm interesting to see what sort of plan they come up with for this confrontation, what it's going to look like. I'm into it. Um, something they can do to like get back at this guy. Uh, maybe fuck up his life a little bit. That would be worth it. Um, I could see Madeline coming up with a way <laughs> and maybe using Celeste's knowledge of the law or something. But then again, like I, Jane in the book doesn't seem like she would want that at all. In the show, she seems maybe a little more open to it. So I'm going to be curious to see if that book version of Jane comes in, out more in the next episode and she really pushes back on this. So I don't think book Jane would agree to this, at least not where as far as we've gotten. Yeah, um, I'm going to be interested to, when we read the book, uh, like how how similar it is to the show that I've already seen. And if you know, if there's deviations that the show makes near the end, um, because I haven't read that and I'm really enjoying the book so far. And, you know, next episode should be fun. Should be. If you enjoyed this episode, let us know in the form of a rating review on whatever app you chose to listen on. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Make sure to connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and also like the videos if you see them. Absolutely. And 
if you'd like to support us financially, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash ink to film. On there, we have bonus episodes that we release monthly, and uh, you have the ability to vote on polls, like the one that selected this show as uh, the project we're currently doing. So if there's ever anything you're like, man, I wish they would cover this, that's the best way to get us to actually cover it. And thank you to Dylan Owen for the use of our intro and outro music. All right. So as I said earlier in the episode, we are taking a week off. Um, we'll be putting out something from the vault. Um, so look forward to that. And then we'll be back in a couple weeks to finish this thing out. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, so am I. Can't wait. And until next time, keep adapting. Keep adapting.